Greetings, ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called The Faceless One, written by In Yellow Clad. Our world is one of many strange and fascinating peoples. The tall and lithe thread, who live in the trees and commune with nature. The brutish and passionate Vozard, who make for excellent and terrifying warriors. The diminutive Viahi, who harness the powers of our world to make life just a little better for us all. The Varax, who seek knowledge wherever it can be found, and who have crafted the largest repository of knowledge in the world. There are more. But for now, I shall leave you with one more. The species which I belong, the Skrinol, a species of lizard-like beings who pride themselves in our ability to construct great cities in a matter of weeks, and who generally make up the aristocracy of many kingdoms. My name is Thraxel, I'm a royal observer, and I've been tasked with the most peculiar job. I'm to observe a being that does not exist anywhere else within the known world, one who simply appeared and what has, so far, been unwilling to share their origins. My encounters with this being began on the day of my arrival in the town of Everfall. It's a little town, not too important or noteworthy, beyond playing host to the strange being. Before the being's arrival, it had been a town of Habit and Churchill. Now, the town had seemed to sink with itself, especially whenever the being made its presence known. I just stepped out of my carriage when I saw them for the first time and was immediately struck dumb by their appearance. A black hooded cloak over a tight black suit, no visible skin, and what looked to be glossy, flexible plates that covered what I presumed to be vital areas in the person's body. But most striking was the angular helm that sat upon their head. Save for a few obvious parts of it, it appeared to be made of darkly tinted glass that reflected the world around it perfectly. I could see no hint of a face in the design of the helmet, nor see a face of a living being behind the glass either. Yet, I could feel their eyes upon me all the same. A sense of being watched filled me with a sense of unease. I felt like I was being hunted, and the predator had me in their sights. I wanted to introduce myself as manners and protocol dictated that I should, and yet I could not find my voice. The being watched me for a moment more, then turned and walked away, a slight sway in the hips that seemed more feminine to me than anything else about them. I could only stand in shock and watch them go before they slipped out of sight. Once I regained my senses, I began a circuit through the town, asking about the mysterious being. The townsfolk all told the same story. She, for the being was in fact a she, had shown up nearly a month before my arrival. She did not seek nor cause violence. She had the first sought information. The knowledge she sought was simple and mundane. What life was like, how well the ruling classes treated those beneath them, how often wars were fought, such simple things. The townsfolk, presuming this being this woman, was simply a shorter thread had found her questions strange, but answered them truthfully enough, or to the best of their abilities. And then she had asked strange questions. She had offered up a potential scenario, beings from the sky descending to our world and raising us to be equals with them. Many soon began to think that she was some kind of missionary, which, in hindsight, I suppose she was of a sort. The town folk, being simple, did not know how to answer such questions, and that was where her questions ended. Instead, she spent her day seemingly preparing the towns for something. Something unknown and potentially sinister. But all evidence would seemingly point to the contrary. As though she's trying to ensure our safety, our understanding, limited as it may be. I'd spent several days in the town before I encountered her again. And when I did, I went on the attack, so to speak. Excuse me a moment if you please, kind lady, I said and I watched as the cloak figure stiffened slightly, then turns to face me. Up close, I can see that there was more to her than I had first observed. Her forearms, for example, were clad in a strange web of metal, almost like a decorative gauntlet was only present enough to be classified as something more than jewelry. The same for the rest of her body. The metal, at least I thought it was metal, 
was thin and flexible, more abundant in places that I assumed housed vital organs, yet still managed to accentuate and even highlight her form. A perfect blending of some unknowable function with form and aesthetic. I swear I felt I even detected a pulsating light within the metal, but it could have simply been my eyes playing tricks on me. The woman did not speak. Instead, she stood before me at something close to attention, like when a soldier is being spoken to by a superior officer. I took a silence as a prompt to continue. If I may, I would like to know your name and your purpose in this town, as well as what species you hail from, for none have encountered any like you before, I asked, doing my best to not sound haughty, though I suspect I failed in that endeavor. She watched me for a moment longer and finally seemed to breathe. Yet the rise of her chest was evidence of breathing. You may not. My name is not for you to know, but my purpose is to prepare you all for the day that may come soon, or much, much later. The voice was wrong, clearly that of a woman, yes, with a lilting quality to it. Yet it also sounded hollow, like the voice of a golem. My species is human, and that is all you need to know for the time being. Even hollow, her words left me feeling agitated. Didn't she know I represented royalty? Shouldn't she be more willing to engage in conversation with me based on that fact alone? Perhaps she did not know, and was merely treating me as she would a commoner. I did my best not to allow irritation to color my words. I see. And just what exactly are you preparing us all for? I should warn you that if it is a threat that we are more than prepared to face and defeat whatever you may set against us. I straightened my back and shoulders, tail lashing at the dirt while my angular chin rose just a pitch higher. Again, there was silence from her, but I watched as her head shifted downwards, then back up, as though she was sizing me up. With all due respect, no, you are not prepared in the slightest, she stated, and the hollowness in her voice had been replaced with a simple, knowing confidence that left me feeling incredibly unsure of myself and my kingdom's capabilities. This encounter is concluded... Good day, sir. And just like that, any momentum I might have had vanished as she turned on her heel and stalked away, leaving me dumbfounded. She moved carefully, and though of the town she passed received soft nods of her heads in silent greeting, I did not know what to do or think. Should I pursue her, threaten her, or perhaps attempt to provide some sort of monetary means to acquire the information I was sent to retrieve? I had only just made up my mind when I noticed she was nowhere to be seen, and so decided I might as well take it easy for the rest of the day. Perhaps ask around a little more. I decided to discover if she happened to be staying at one of the inns or outside of town limits. Most did not know, but one surprised me. She is staying in the old cottage on the outskirts of town, my lord, the Via said, using his natural magical powers to add to the forger's heat. Folks who lived there passed on about a month ago, and it's been vacant ever since. It's nice to see the lights up there on the hill again. Yeah, and which way is this cottage, my good man? Uh, northeast, my lord, can't miss it, especially at night. For his assistance on the matter, I made sure to slip him a piece of gold, as payment for the knowledge he had provided. It was the least I could do for his aiding of an agent of the crown. I spent the rest of the day pondering my course of action, and decided that perhaps I should do a little covert investigation come nightfall. Stealth may not be my strong suit, but I was sure that I could learn something this evening. Night came, and I slipped from the inn which I was staying at, adorned in dark clothes that helped my already dark scales blend a bit better into the darkness. Turning my snout northeast, I began to short track to the cottage, and was pleased to discover that the forge hand was not lying when he said that it was hard to miss. My pace slowed as I left the confines of the town, my body naturally sinking lower and lower till I was nearly crawling on my hands and feet through the tall grass, which wasn't necessarily a dignified thing for me to be doing, but necessity almost called for it. Finally, I reached the side of the cottage and slowly rose to my feet, doing my best not to let my claws scrape against stone walls while I peered in through the tall window. I didn't expose my entire head, just the crest, beneath which my eyes resided, and I got a look at this human, as she had called herself. She had shed the cloak, which hung from the hook near the door, but she had not removed the helmet, nor the rest of the attire, save for the metal accoutrements, which lay in an orderly manner on the dining table. 
Wandering around the room, she seemed to be doing a rather mundane chores, cleaning mostly, which made sense. Even if her apparent mission did not last too long, she would want her current domicile to be livable and pleasant to a degree. This did not seem sinister at all, and yet the mystery remained. But then things changed and certainly got interesting, for she stiffened and stood up straighter, holding out a hand with a palm facing the ceiling. Upon it, a figure of light approached, tiny in comparison to her. They conversed, and yet it was in a language I could not understand. I did my best to try and capture the meaning of the conversation. Whatever they were talking about set the mysterious woman on edge, agitating her in a way that none had witnessed so far. The conversation came to an end. As her fingers curled into a fist, her arm dropping to her side as she heaved a sigh, a sigh that transcended all species barriers, for it was one I'd utilized time and time again when things seemingly just kept going wrong. I could sympathize with that, and it lent this woman a more familiar and understandable air. Before I could muse further, she went stiff again, and her head suddenly jerked towards me, prompting me to duck down, out of sight, and rush off as quickly as I could. Just as I entered the town, I could hear the distant clatter of a door slamming open, but not the sounds of pursuit, so I was hopefully in the clear. I returned to the inn and secluded myself in my room for the rest of the evening. Mulling over what I had witnessed, I was certain that this stranger was up to sinister deeds of subtle variety. Something had to be done, but what? I dared not engage her in physical combat, for I knew not her capabilities, nor if she possessed magic, and if she did, how powerful in the arcane arts she was. Though the small figure that had appeared over her palm suggested magic of sort, but nothing like I had ever seen. Before I knew it, I was asleep and when I awoke I'd expect to find myself listening to the dulcet tones of early morning, birds chirping, and people just starting to rise. Instead, I was met with screams of shock and horror, and I watched in mute terror as the roof above my head was peeled away by a tentacle that descended from the heavens. It defied all reason, all sense and comprehension. A dark god sat above our heads and had come to reap a harvest of mortals. I'm not ashamed to admit that I screamed in less than a dignified manner and rushed to protect myself from the tentacle that curled towards me. My claws sank into a piece of debris, and though I was no warrior, in the heat of the moment I hefted the heavy piece of old wood with ease and swung it at the tentacle. It connected with some force, but did little to dissuade the tendril's inexorable approach. My eyes widened, and I continued to smack at the tendril, hoping that perhaps I could wound it enough to make it reconsider taking me away. But alas, my hopes were dashed as it began to encircle me. Whoop! The sound began as a mere tingle at the base of my skull, then became something more, something that set me on edge. In those terrible moments where the world had slowed, as I had been about to be trapped, a sapphire beam of light slid into my field of view and swung towards the tentacle. Then it simply passed through it, slicing the limb apart several times as it was guided back and forth through the air. An unholy roar escaped the dark god above us, whose body I could now faintly see as it just barely breached the last layers of clouds. With my entrapment postponed, I followed the beam of light to its source and was surprised to see the woman, the stranger, standing in the street with an arm stretched upwards and pointing towards what had once been an intact tentacle. In her other hand, she wielded a thin sword of pure light, which crackled and hissed with barely restrained energy and magic. Without thinking, I rushed from our room and further shed a veiny veil of decorum I still possessed by using the exterior wall to my advantage. I raced to her side as she calmly walked towards the inn, giving her sword a twirl. Stranger, there is no glory to be had here. Run, run, save as many as you can. I beg this of you. I screamed over the din, reaching out for her suit and clutching at it just below the neck. I caught the raising of her free hand to and expected to be slapped or punched. Instead, she rested her hand upon my arms. Though I could not see her face, I got the feeling that she was trying to be reassuring, which, while considerate of her, was not useful at this time. Please relax, seek shelter. I can handle this. There is nothing to fear. Kindly release me, if you please, she said, a compulsion that was surely magical in nature, forcing me to do as she bid. 
I released her, and she stepped past me, and though I think she felt I could not hear it, I heard her utter a strange thing. This is wrong. I thought we had more time. As I watched, she began moving a little faster, and as I looked up at the sky, I saw her haste was with good reason. For the Leviathan of God was shuddering and shaking itself, shedding small objects from its body and it streaked to the land below. They landed with great force, splattering blood and bone around their impact craters, and from them emerged monstrous horrors that I had never even dreamed were possible. They were screeched and gibbered, attacking any that were unfortunate enough to be within reach. And then she was amongst them, and the hunters became the hunted. She was magnificent, twirling and ducking under blades of bone and maws filled with wicked teeth. That blade of light swept back and forth with deft, easy motions, parting flesh from flesh and severing bones with terrible ease. From her other arm, I saw her metal webbing had morphed, forming what looked like an angular tubes that spun magically around her forearm. Then bolts of sapphire light started to spew from the rapidly spinning tubes, punching holes through the monsters, and where they touched the ground or building, they detonated with great force. She swept her arm back and forth, mowing down her foes with ease, only afforded to the divine. And then, a new sound reached us, and I looked up once more, as a horn sounded from the heavens that shook the very ground beneath my feet. The dark god began to rise, a fearful brain leaving it, and I sensed that the gods did not look too favorably upon its intrusion into their domain. My attention snapped away from the Leviathan as a stranger stopped and held up her hand, a figure appearing over the palm just as it had the night before. They spoke again in that strange tongue, her voice clipped and angry, but not at the figure she spoke to. The figure said something that sounded almost like an order to me. She nodded, closing a fist, and then looking back up at the Leviathan of a god. With a final sweep of her sword, she cut down the last beast before raising both hands, metal webbing around them shifting and becoming pointed stars that glowed with light. My eyesight is leagues beyond that of the other races. I spotted some sort of beam being emitted by the stars, which reached up towards the dark god and latched on. Around her legs the same happened, except they anchored themselves to the ground which flexed and cracked in places as though some great force was pulling at it. A grunt of exertion left her as she was jerked forward suddenly, but she did not falter nor allow herself to be pulled away from her spot. Instead, she pulled her arms back, groaning as she did, and to my amazement, the dark god moved with her, pulled back down towards the ground by a small amount. I doubted she could keep her from free for long, but I doubted she meant to hold it still indefinitely. She was merely delaying it. But for what purpose? A barb shattered past her helmet, sending pieces of jagged broken glass flying as she let out a cry and lashed out with her hand. I watched in stunned silent awe as the beast that had harmed her was suddenly crushed by the nearly invisible force she created. Then she focused fully on the dark god which had managed to slip just a bit further away. But she pulled it back, and I moved to her side, wondering if I could be of some use. I finally got a look at her in the process, and was surprised to find that she bore no scales upon her features, which were blunted much more than the Thryad. Yet, where they were almost exclusively pale of flesh, hers was darker, almost the same tone as the bark of a tree. Yet, she was clearly not some sort of plant-based being. She was flesh and blood like myself. Yet as I watched, I could see her flesh starting to decay, causing her to hiss and glance at me with the shiny blue eyes. Pouch left side, grab the can and spray it on my helmet. Quickly, she rasped. And I leapt into action, finding this can thing, and after accidentally spraying the midst of something into the air, did as she asked. The mist became a puddle of grey liquid upon her helmet, Then it moved over the damaged area and became more glass, seeding her helmet up instantly. Good, thank you. Now step back. The cavalry is here, she said. Her voice once more filtered through the helmet. She released the dark guard and stepped back several paces, with me following as a rumble started in the sky. I'd only just turned my gaze to the Leviathan when a world went dark, but not because the sun had vanished. 
But as a beam of crackling red light shot down from the sky and speared through the dark god, which screamed in agony, more beams launched through it, then converged upon the first. As I watched, a pulse went through the much larger beam, and upon making contact with the Leviathan, it exploded with such fury and wrath that I swore I would just witnessed the gods smiting their greatest foe. The dark god fell to the earth, impaling itself upon the mountain, and then the gods erased the mountain, more beams of light sweeping through it with ruthless efficiency. I looked to the stranger. The woman had brought the god's wrath down upon such a terrible foe. Who are you? Will you be all right? I asked. And she looked at me for a long moment, just as a new shadow darkened the sky, and she looked up. I followed her gaze, and she saw a thing of metal descend to hover over us. Sleek lines and hard angles. It was the single most beautiful and terrifying thing that I have ever seen. We hoped that we would have more time before the discussion took place, but the Nezessi have forced our hand this day, she said with a sigh, her head hanging for a moment. I'll be all right. Your air is poison to me, thus the helmet and the suit, but I will be all right. We will adapt eventually. She sounded tired, and I could not falter for that. But to answer your question, she paused, searching for the right words. I am the Herald of Humanity, and I wish to welcome you into a world beyond imagining. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Casper Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.